of non-local conformal invariance in asymptotic hyperbolic setting. So, please. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, I was a student of Blaine Lawson and since uh, in graduate school, and I took my first class in graduate level differential geometry and my first course of several complex variables, all from Blaine. And he made the material so simple, elegant, and understandable. <laughs> and the subject is beautiful. Okay. I wish to thank you for that. OK, so today I want to talk about on a class of non-local conformal invariance in a conformal compact Einstein manifold or in sometimes in asymptotic hyperbolic manifold. So, what I want to talk about is a very simple operator. Okay. So this is an operator which I denote by P2 gamma of f. And so this is an order 2 gamma operator. And the leading symbol is minus Laplace to the gamma power. And frequently, I will take gamma to be a fractional number. So this becomes a non-local operator. That means the behavior of a function at a point depends on the behavior of the function at a global domain instead of locally. Okay. So, and so the outline of my talk is the following. First, I will start with a, a result of Caffaretti and Silvestro, and they talk about this just on flat Euclidean space and Laplace to the gamma power. And I will put an emphasis on the result, so-called the extension theorem. And then I will try to say that, uh, in fact, this result of Cavaretti and Silvestro can be translated to the conformal compact Einstein setting. And this is just a translation. And then, when translating it, one knows that this operator is also, of course, defined for gamma up to n over 2 and greater than 0, not only for gamma between 1 and 0. And then, I want to talk about that in this translation, one sees a simple application of this extension theorem in this setting. And now, I want to talk about some recent work, I mean, very recent work, saying that actually this caffaretti Silvestro extension can be on the classical setting has an extension to gamma bigger than one. Okay. And then I want to say a little bit of why we are interested in a case when gamma is bigger than one, in particular, for example, for gamma equal to three over two in this particular setting. And then this is relating to a subject which is uh, in conformal field theory and, for example, to derive a formula for the renormalized volume in this setting. Okay. So uh, now uh, let me uh, recall the well-known result which is actually mentioned by Rick Chen this morning, and that's the Dirichlet-Neumann operator. So on a Euclidean space, we talk, consider a harmonic function, and we uh, say uh, my space is upper half space, and the boundary function is the function f. And then one thing we know is that if we take the u y derivative and restrict it to the boundary, it's actually equal to this minus Laplace one half operating on f. And it's a classical result, and it's easy to see. For example, suppose we call TF this minus the uh, U derivative, y deri U differential with respect to Y on the boundary, then the observation is if U is a harmonic function, so is UY in this setting. So if you apply T to TF, you apply T to minus UY, and so that means it's UYY because UY is also harmonic. And now, you, because Laplace U is equal to zero, UYY is actually minus Laplace X 
on U, and so this is minus Laplace x on F. So that means T is Laplace to the one half. So, and now let's the, take a look at the situation of gamma between one and zero. Okay. So in that case, we need to restrain, constrain a class of F, say in some suitable class, so there's this classical definition using Bessel transform. And now, this Laplace F is defined, Laplace gamma F is, uh, the leading symbol is C to the two gamma F hat C. And Cavaretti and Silvestro in 2006 extend this uh, well-known classical result to the case of gamma between one and zero. So what they say is, in this case, you look at this problem, which is a generalized Dirichlet problem, but with a weight. That weight is y to the a's power, and a is one minus two gamma. So when gamma equal to one half, this a is zero, and we are back to the harmonic function. And if I solve this differential equation, and you restrict to the still on a boundary equal to f, then Laplace gamma f is limit of y to the a's power uy up to a constant. So this is an extension theorem. And one point I want to emphasize in this theorem is the following. So when there are many ways to see this result, it's a simple classical result. But on the other hand, in the proof of Cavaretti and Silvestro, they pointed out one fact. And that one fact is that if f is in H gamma class, that by that means gamma derivative in L2, then there is an energy identity. That is, if one takes this U, which satisfies this differential equation, divergence of y to the eighth power U equal to zero, and then, one sees that uh, this uh, uh, gradient u square ya, this uh, uh, integration on upper half space, is actually equal to this uh, plus gamma ff. Okay, so there is an uh, identity. And actually, the way they derive this boundary identification of this minus plus gamma f is equal to this Neumann I mean, uh, 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 ui times y to the eighth derivative. They identify this as a variational problem, saying that it follows from this energy identity. If you look at the variation on the boundary, and this must be true. Okay, so this is a consequence of the energy identity. And since uh, the result was done, of course, there are many applications, in particular to free boundary value problem and to other problems. But uh, uh, I will not talk about their application. Instead, I will talk about in a conformal compact Einstein setting. So in this in conformal compact Einstein setting, we know that there is a class of operator, which I denote by two P2 gamma, which exists for two gamma less than or equal to n, and when n is odd, otherwise it exists for all n, and which agrees with minus Laplace to the gamma power in the situation when your upper half space and with Rn as boundary. And in the upper half space, you put in Poincaré metric. So in this case, so we want to see that uh, uh, how to translate this result, the extension theorem, to this setting, okay, to this uh, general con conformal compact Einstein setting. And it turns out it's very easy, and that is uh, due to the following connection, and the connection is the following. So on uh, n minus one dimensional space with an uh, n-dimensional boundary, and in this case, let me put a metric G plus defined on N plus one, which is a Poincaré-Einstein metric. 
So for example, the Poincaré metric identifies Risi. And here there is uh, something which is wrong. Um, suppose a G plus is uh, even asymptotic hyperbolic, or an uh, you know, R square G plus is compact. In that case, there is a special coordinate function. And that coordinate function, uh, defining function for the manifold, rho is positive on x equal to 0 on n, and whose derivative is 1 near a neighborhood of m. In that neighborhood, one can rewrite this Einstein metric as d rho square rho square plus g rho. And in this case, this g bar is compact rho square g plus, and let me denote its boundary metric g rho on the restrict rho equal to 0 to g0. And m is usually called conformal infinity of x. And in this subject, if one will notice that the definition of g plus have many choice of rho, so that means this definition only depending on a conformal class of g0. That is, if you stretch g0 by a positive function, you are just changing the rho multiplied by a factor, and the metric g plus stays the same. OK, so in this setting, there's one line missing. Given an arbitrary function f, which is a smooth function on the boundary, one can consider this uh, uh, eigenvalue problem for the g plus metric, which is a degenerate elliptic metric. So consider this uh, Laplace u minus this lambda u equal to 0 on x, just an eigenvalue problem. There is a well-known result of Mazero and Melrose. They say that for lambda bigger than n squared over 4, there is always solution. But for lambda between 0 to n over 4, n squared over 4, there are finite many, maybe finite many exceptional numbers. So let's ignore the finite many exceptional number and consider real s bigger than n over 2 and solution of this problem. And it turns out that in that case, one easily check rho to the n minus s and rho s are asymptotic solutions. In a, when rho is very small, they are solutions. And so one can write this u, this solution, into rho to the n minus s times f, it's a work of Melrose and Mazero, plus, and then the important thing is, after one subtract this off, the next order term is rho to the s power and h. So this f is, uh, has leading term, the given function f, and then the next order term is rho square, rho fourth, and so on. And so U, this solution is usually the, called the Poisson equation, uh, PS of F. So the scattering matrix is defined to be an operator from smooth function of M, C infinity on M to smooth function on M, and it's defined by looking at F, solve this solution U, and get H, and then restrict h to the boundary. Okay. So this is the scattering metric. And for this scattering metric, okay. scattering metric, suppose we design, define s equal to n over 2 plus gamma, then p2 gamma is defined to be s n over 2 plus gamma is a class of pseudo differential operator. Okay. And when s equal to the integer n over 2 plus k, then this scattering operator has a simple pole. And in that case, if one takes the residue at the simple pole, then this p2k is a class of differential operator of order 2k. And <clears throat> so this uh, 
class of differential operator all have so-called conformal covariant property. And that means if you change the metric G0 to a metric conformal to it, so multiply it by positive function, then P2K with respect to this G0 hat metric transform by this following rule. For any smooth function phi, it operating on phi is like P2K with respect to G0, and then operating on the function phi with the weight. Okay. And that's called conformal covariant property. And when k equal to 1, this P2 is the famous operator that's called the Yamabe operator or conformal Laplace operator. So it's just Laplace plus a fixed constant multiple of a scalar curvature function. And so this has a conformal covariant property of order 2. And now, when k equal to 2, it turns out independently in 1983, uh, Penny's has write down this operator. So this operator has leading order term Laplace square plus a second order correction term, and that uh, consists of divergence and differential, and then the coefficient is in terms of scalar and Ricci curvature of the metric. And then plus sensing the Q curvature. Okay? So there is a P4G is uh, it's like the scalar curvature now is replaced by the row is replaced by the Q curvature. So there's a, so at this moment I'm only saying there is a differential operator of order two, four, and so on. Each has conformal covariant property. So, and so in general, for all k, uh, this operator is independently discovered by uh, Robin Grant, Jenny, Mason, and Spalding, called GJMS operator. It all exists. And here I only want to say that P2 gamma, when gamma is not an integer, also has conformal covariant property. And now it's uh, the weight now is n minus 2 gamma over 2 w. And the standard notation in this case, in PDE setting, if you are more familiar with it, is we always write instead of the conformal matrix as e to w g naught, we write it usually as a function to 4 over n minus 2 gamma power, and then you have the conformal covariant property. So in this class, of operator, if in a special setting of upper health space, a Euclidean and hyperbolic metric, dy squared plus dx squared y squared, then this g bar is y squared gh dy dx squared is just the flat metric on upper health space. And in general, of course, there are many such metrics. Uh, hyperbolic ball with sphere as conformal infinity is another model. OK, so now we translate the result of uh, uh, Caffaretti and Silvestro to this setting. So the translation is the following. Suppose we have a CCE setting. And then we look at this eigenvalue problem. At the moment, s equal to n over 2 gamma with respect to this Einstein metric. And now, and if we begin to, uh, if you look at the previous slide, I'm sorry, uh, you know that uh, U has this power, F rho to the n minus S power plus H rho S. And F restrict to the boundary is little f. So that means, when we translate the PDE, we should consider capital U, which is rho to the S um, U power, and this U restrict to the boundary is F. So if one use the conformal covariant property of second order operator, then one can rewrite this equation, in turn, which is in terms of this Einstein metric into this G bar metric. And then the equation become LG bar plus this 
gradient GU dot with gradient G bar of the weight, which is log rho to the eighth power. Okay, so rho to the eighth power and rho minus a, so it's log rho. So in the flat case, this is exactly the equation which I write down here. Okay, because in this case, uh, this rho is the same as y. So this is the same equation, and conformal Laplace in this case is just Laplace. Okay, and so what we say these two equations are actually the same, and then this P2 gamma operator is now defined be between gamma n over 2 to 0, and we also know its limit. Its limit now is rho to the a naught power d rho, and then there is composition of rho inverse d rho to m times. Okay. So for example, when gamma is between 1 and 0, you have rho to the 1 minus 2 gamma d rho u. That's the same thing as Cavaretti's rho to the a's power dy du with respect u with respect differentiate with respect to y. And then when gamma between 2 and 1, we actually have rho to the 3 to the 2 gamma d rho, rho inverse d rho of u, and that rho tends to 0. That is the way to recapture the operator p 2 gamma of m. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, just a translation of the result, but we notice now it exists for all gamma between n over 2 to 0 and so on. Okay, and now let me say that uh, this simple translation uh, has some geometric application. Let me mention two. Okay. So uh, one simple application is the following. So um, in this field, uh, hyperbolic, asymptotic hyperbolic or conformal compact Einstein setting, one is interested to study the location of the scattering pole. Okay. So what does that mean? It, it's, uh, in sim uh, it should be mean that uh, uh, it's the pole of the scattering operator. And we already know this scattering operator has a simple pole at n over 2 plus 1, n over 2 plus 2, and so on. But in this case, actually, we are interested in something which is a regularized scattering pole. That is, we modulo the 1 over gamma at this number minus gamma. And that means that for this pole, which are simple pole at n over 2 plus 1, n over 2 plus 2, and so on, we exclude it out. These are not considered to be pole. And it turns out this notion is also equivalent to study the uh, pole of the resolvent metric. Okay, but I don't want to mention that. So we are interested to study the scattering pole. And in one case, one have a, a result telling us about when is, what's the location of the scattering pole. And so this is the case when x is hyperbolic, ball, hyperbolic space quotient of group, and its group is convex, co-compact, torsion free. And then we look at the domain of discontinuity of this group, and we think about as a identify it as a set of SM. And now the conformal infinity of X is omega of this gamma quotient gamma. And one knows in under this assumption it's locally conformally flat. That means the vial part vanishes. So in this case, uh, Rick Shen and Yao has a famous theorem which says if on this manifold we have a positive scalar curvature, then one can compute the Hausdorff dimension of this set, Sm minus the limiting set, Sm minus omega gamma. And the Hausdorff dimension is n over 2 subtract 1. And later on, this del gamma also have other geometrical meaning. For example, it's Poincaré exponent of gamma, of the group gamma. And Peter Perry also identified this number del gamma to be the largest 
real scattering pole. Okay. So that means in this setting, assuming M is a positive scalar curvature, then one knows there is no real pole sitting on N over 2 subtract 1. Uh, so there is no pole. The largest pole is N over 2 subtract 1. N over 2 is here. There is no simple pole when on this uh, line, along the real line of S. And this result turns out to have a generalization to this setting for conformal compact Einstein manifold, and that's a recent work of Jie Qing and Gilamu. Okay. So what they have proved is that, and indeed, in this conformal compact Einstein setting, if again we assume the Yamabe constant is positive on the conformal infinity, then the first real scattering pole is less than or equal to n over 2 subtract 1. OK, so now the, if we look at this statement, and we also know that uh, the scattering operator somehow is symmetric with respect to n over 2. So this s n over 2 minus gamma, s n over 2 plus gamma is identity. So something which is not a pole is equivalent to say the other side is not a zero. So a translation of Qing and uh, Qing Jie and Gilamu's result is actually saying in this case, P2 gamma F, F is a positive operator. The, this uh, operator P2 gamma F in the product with F is also always greater than or equal to zero for all gamma between one and zero. So now let me uh, give a, a proof which is slightly different than the original proof and using this extension theorem okay, of Cavaretti and Silvestro. So in this case, we have assuming the boundary Yamabe class is positive on this CCE setting. And now, there is a work of John Lee in 95. In this case, he says that if the boundary Yamabe class is positive, then there is no L2 eigenvalue of Laplace plus on this interval. Mazero uh, and Melro say there may be finite many exceptional case of point spectrum. But uh, uh, this, if the boundary is of positive scalar class, then there is no such exception. That's what the John Lee's results say. But if I examine his proof, his proof is using one comparison function, and that comparison function is he tried to solve on the whole manifold a solution of the function minus Laplace plus V equal to N plus 1. And why does he solve that? And if one look at this equation, one notes it's a linearized equation of the scalar curvature. So if one finds such solution, and this solution turns out to be 1 over rho and plus 1 plus a constant rho square and so on in your m. And that means that this v minus 2 g plus metric is a totally geodesic on boundary. Okay. So and then if I examine his proof, look at this solution, actually what he has proved is this metric V minus 2 G plus is of positive scalar curvature on X. So given a, a boundary Yamabe class positive on CCE setting, you now know that the conformal compact, the interior is also positive Yamabe class. So based on that thing, we know that this G metric, G theta metric, we can use it to translate the result of this solution eigenvalue problem to U and using the metric G theta. And so the translation would say for this suitable U, this U will satisfy this conformal Laplace in G theta on U is zero. Okay, so in this special setting, when gamma equal to one half, 
s equal to n over 2 plus 1 half. And in this case, so LGUU is equal to 0, and we write down its energy. The energy is just gradient u squared plus this r, scalar curvature u squared. But scalar curvature now is positive. So we have a positive engine and positive energy. And then the boundary function is just P1FF because of this energy identity. So we conclude that this RG is positive. Scalar curvature of this compatified metric positive means P1F is positive. Okay. And this proof can easily be pushed to all gamma between 1 and 0. That's because in this other case, our equation satisfy uh, some generalized that is uh, LGU plus some gradient U dot gradient of rho to the A. And then we use this uh, simple uh, calculus identity minus the plus psi U U, and then this with weight e to the minus psi. And then if Laplace psi is this Laplace minus gradient psi gradient, then we still have this integration by part is the maintains the energy plus boundary term. So the proof, the same proof goes for all gamma between 1 and 0. OK, so now let me mention a, a recent result for Gonzalez and Ching, which again, they apply this uh, extension theorem to show, to solve a problem called fractional Yamabe problem. And that is, they try to solve a equation. So the fractional Laplace problem means we try to solve for the corresponding P2 gamma. We have, maybe I should call it the Q2 gamma or curvature. We want to solve this PDE with some positive number. And that means with respect to the suitable F to the 2n over m2 gamma metric, this Q gamma is a constant. So it's like the analog of Yamabe problem. And in this case, they can solve the thing on asymptotic hyperbolic manifold. Okay. So they only need the metric to be the sectional curvature to be close to minus 1 near the boundary. And in this case, the P1 of f when gamma equal to 1 half, they thought they solve is du d normal and then plus mean curvature. And in this case, q1 half in this case is the mean curvature. So solving this problem becomes a problem of solving on the boundary. You have a mean curvature equal to constant metric. And one key thing in their proof is they use how do you solve this problem on a manifold. So one thing they, in this setting, well, one thing is they use a corollary of this extension theorem. The extension theorem says that if U is a minimum energy, then we have this uh, integration is equal to this energy term. So by the Sobolov embedding, we also have f of 2n over n minus 2 gamma less than this. This is a classical Sobolov embedding theorem. And now we have a Sobolov trace inequality. So that means to solve this PDE on the boundary, we should think about the energy. It is a variational problem with energy inside. And that energy, we know, is in terms of uh, this uh, 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 equation which correspond to this equation on the CCE setting or conformal Laplace equation. So we have energy term. And of course, uh, they have uh, uh, other technical problem and say this uh, uh, trace of block inequality, one knows the extremum, but the extremum uh, is a class of diffeomorphism, diffeomorphism where f tends to infinity, it blow up. So they, have, they need to derive positive mass for this fractional operator uh, to say the minimum exists. And then they also, the other thing they have to overcome is a half boundary value maximum principle for such a fractional Laplace operator. 
and they succeeded in doing the first step, and in the second step, they did it for partial cases. And now, so they have this extension, and then they say that uh, due to this, uh, since uh, Cavaretti's result is between gamma one and two, one and zero, so their result also only holds for gamma between one and zero. And now we ask our question, the question, what happens when gamma is bigger than one? Okay. And a more interesting question could be, why are we interested in that? Okay. And why are we interested in gamma bigger than one? So um, if we look at this energy identity, one knows it cannot hold when gamma is bigger than one. And that's because of Sobolov embedding. One look at this H gamma class, when, when gamma is over a certain range, we know it's not bound by the first derivative. And now, there is some reason work of uh, Ray Young, which he did is, he began to say that, then in this case, when, for example, when gamma equal to three over two case, one should begin to consider the double Laplace, the biharmonic function, and then we have the same energy identity, and then one can identify this, say, three over two norm equal to DD normal of Laplace. And he also explained that why this Laplace U square is a suitable replacement of the original energy. And that's because it's a regularized energy. And this, uh, the first, in this case, y to the one minus two a is minus two. And this term blow up and it compensated by the other blow up term. And the limit is our energy. Okay. And Okay, and the other thing is uh, one notice that uh, when gamma, by the way, it's a technical, this result holds for all gamma between n over two to one, and in particular, uh, let me just mention one point, that for example, for other gamma, the equation to solve is Laplace B square U, where this is put a different way, that B now is three minus two gamma. I didn't write, B is a three minus two gamma when gamma is a plus. So A is one minus two gamma, B is three minus two gamma. Okay. And put in different way, he get the same result. And then uh, one can generalize this, this for all. Um. Now, uh, the only remark I want to make is uh, the following. So why in this case it's natural to consider double Laplace by harmonic map? Okay. And there is a, a the, it's by consideration of Sobolov embedding theorem the order. It's also because of the following algebraic fact. That is, if one look at this differential equation at the point A equal to minus two, say gamma equal to three over two case, then this equation also is biharmonic. One just compute, okay, and to see it's biharmonic. And this fair turns out to be also true in the CCE setting. So in the CCE setting, suppose we look at this S, which is n over two plus three over two, and look at this eigenvalue problem, and then we are reaching the, the lambda square now is n square minus nine over four. And since this is the Einstein metric, this P4 operator, as I have said, in general, the expression is quite complicated, involving Q curvature and so on. But for Einstein metric, it's very simple. It's a composition of this minus the plus minus n square. It has eigenvalue n minus n square minus nine over four and composite with this conformal Laplace. So if in this case, we also have P4 U equal to zero, and because of the order, this P4 G bar of U is equal to zero too, okay? So that means the correct analog of the energy in this case is actually to deal with double Laplace and P4. And now, uh, Maybe I should uh, say that why we are interested in these higher order operators, P4, 
P3 and pushing gamma beyond one. Okay. And the reason for that is the following. If we look at the following picture, so on the flat setting, we consider Laplace operator and its corresponding boundary, say, DD normal. And we know on a manifold, this is replaced by conformal Laplace, second order Laplace operator, and a rubbing boundary, DD normal plus mean curvature. That's the corresponding operator. And then this L is used to study scalar curvature, and the boundary operator is to study mean curvature. So in geometry now, we study, so this makes, in conformal geometry or in geometry, we study this functional, scalar curvature plus mean curvature. And one observation is, of course, this holds for all dimension, and because we have this scalar curvature, it holds for all manifold of dimension bigger than or equal to three, but the information is more profound when we have d equal to two, because in that case, the functional we are considering is Gaussian curvature plus geodesic curvature. And we know the combination of this is a topological quantity, and that's the Euler characteristic of the manifold. Okay, so that leads one to think that in the case, if we begin to consider the other picture of this, uh, uh, of in the flat case, if one consider Laplace square and with this DD normal of Laplace, so this is the flat case, and in the manifold case, that means we should replace this by P4 operator and then this replaced by P3 operator, this conformal covariant operator. And then the corresponding curvature, one study, is the Q4 and Q3 operator. And one wonder if there is a geometrical content of these curvatures, and in particular, if this content is more topological, more information in dimension four with three-dimensional boundary. And it turns out that this is indeed the case. And we have a uh, uh, if one look at uh, Q4, uh, P4, as I say, it's double Laplace plus correction term and plus uh, Q curvature. But when dimension four, this Q curvature term drop out because of this constant. But on the other hand, Bronson independently study this Q4 in four dimension. He said you can somehow continue this dimension to four as a Q4 operator. And this Q4 in this case can be written down. And that's Laplace R plus R squared minus 3C squared. So the P4 corresponds to Q4. And we would like to think about this Q4 as plays the role of Gaussian curvature, P4 as plays the role of uh, this uh, Laplace, conformal Laplace operator. And in this setting, one notice that this Q4 in a four manifold indeed has a geometrical meaning, and that is the Euler characteristic is via square plus Q4, integration Q4. And in this case, this via square D volume in dimension four is a pointwise conformal invariant. So that means this integration Q4 is a conformal invariant. And this similar thing goes on for manifold with boundary. And in that case, one look at gauss bonnet And on the boundary term, we carefully split it into two parts. One is a pointwise conformal invariant part. One is an integral invariant part. So this Q4 on the interior plus the boundary Q4, Q3, is an invariant, is a conformal invariant. And this Q3 operator can also be carefully written down. Okay. And the formula is complicated. So one does not know what does this term add up means. But on the other hand, in one setting, this is easy. And the setting is, suppose our boundary metric G is totally geodesic. So in that case, this Q3 only has one term, 
that's dr, d normal. And if we compare this term to the leading term of Q4, there's a la plus r, one notice the integration of Q4 on the interior, the boundary term, cancels out this Q3 term, leading term, if the coefficient is correct. Okay? And that is indeed the case. So that leads to the consideration that uh, this uh, Q4 plus this constant times Q3, a suitable constant, is cancel out this Laplace R term and become a curvature term. That's scalar curvature minus 3 Ricci squared. Okay. So we know that is a conformal invariant quantity in this setting. And so now then, let's consider one, the other global conformal invariant which interests people in conformal field theory, and that's the notion of renormalized volume. So in this uh, CCE setting, let's consider uh, the volume of G rho greater than epsilon and one expand it out. So it is, uh, I only talk about the boundary N is R. So there is uh, epsilon minus one CN and plus a term. And it turns out this constant term is independent of the choice of the distance function rho. So it's a conformal invariant. And in this case, there is actually a result of Michael Anderson in 2001. He says that in this setting, the, uh, the renormalized volume differ from vial curvature and is satisfied this formula. formula. And compare this formula to our formula, which also comes from gauss bonnet formula, we conclude that this V4 is this scalar curvature square minus three Ricci square integration over the boundary and for any total ledger density compactification. And now, why are we interested in this quantity? Uh, renormalized volume is a, a global quantity. We now have a local expression, local formula of it. And because we know that uh, in this case, the size, in particular, the positivity of this gives strong topological and geometric constraint on the type of extension. So here is a result, early result of my show with Qingjie and Po Yang, which we say that in this case, again, if we assume the boundary Yamabe class is positive, then, so the formula, the strange number here, there, comes from this, uh, comes from this formula that uh, I have four pi square order characteristic equal to pi square plus six V in this three plus one setting. So in this case, we are saying that if this V plus is sufficiently positive compared to this topological number, okay? So for example, it is greater than one third, six V plus, is greater than one is greater than a portion of it, then the manifold is already homomorphic to the four ball up to some finite cover. And the other uh, result is if it's greater than one half, so that means this part is greater than that part. Okay, it's a, a positive and very positive, then the we have a rigidity theorem. Then the manifold, the fill-in is already the hyperbolic ball, and the boundary is already the standard S3. Okay. So this is a strong result, and it depends on uh, the understanding of the reflection. Reflect double, and depends on early work of uh, Michel, Gursky, and Paul Young. So we are interested in this quantity. And now let me conclude my talk by saying that uh, uh, using this type of consideration, and in particular, the connection of this renormalized volume to Q curvature, we now can derive an explicit formula for this uh, renormalized volume for all dimension, for all dimension R. So, but this is accumulation, observation, 
from uh, people, work of many people. Okay. So I wouldn't mention, for example, the Grand Jew and uh, Grand Roski and so on. So, and the local formula for this uh, uh, for local, I mean, it's a global quantity we use. Uh, explicit formula is the following. Turns out very simple. We look at this metric, and then the zero has this expansion. We now consider the volume form of this metric G rho over rho square, this volume form, and expand it out in terms of rho, asymptotically expanded out. So there is V2 term of rho square, V4 term of rho force, and so on. And a reason work we have is, in this case, when N is odd, boundary is odd, this renormalized volume is this Vn plus 1, so n is odd, n plus 1 is even. This metric on this any totally geodesic compactification and D volume. Okay. So what is it? Okay. What, what is it? And that is actually the following. So uh, when n equal to 3 by the result of uh, Anderson and uh, compare the connection I mentioned to gauss bonnet before, we already know V4 is a multiple of scalar curvature minus 3 rho z squared. Okay. And it turns out a better expression of that is we consider it to be the second symmetric function of a tensor. And that tensor is a combination of rho z to scalar called Shorten tensor. And uh, this consideration is because uh, in conformal geometry, the full curvature tensor split into vial and plus this shortened tensor. Okay. So in this case, we consider the second symmetric function of that. So that means it's the uh, trace of A square minus the norm of A square. Trace of the shortened tensor is scalar curvature. So we have scalar curvature minus a multiple of Vc square. So that's V4. And in the case of V6, so that is 5 plus 1 setting, it turns out we will very much hope that this V6 is just the third symmetric function of this shortened tensor. But it turns out there is correction term. Okay? And that correction term is a, a, a Bach tensor of force, some kind of force derivative of metric and then trace with the Shorten tensor can be written down. And this formula all inductively can be written down, but it's getting complicated. And so we can write down this V6, and this V6 is uh, uh, in the 5 plus 1 dimension set setting integration of that is the renormalized volume. And how do we achieve this theorem? And the result is actually we look at the connection of this expression VK, V2K, to this Q curvature. Okay. And we know that this invariant should be, so in this case, we know the invariant should be QN plus 1 on N plus 1 dimensional setting plus some kind of maybe a multiple on the boundary of QN, boundary integration. Yeah. So the strategy is we try to choose some particular conformal class such that this term, although this expression is complicated, we choose something where this is easy to compute. And then, say, for example, one strategy is like solving the boundary Yamabe problem, pushing the scalar curvature equal to zero. That is, we push QN plus one equal to zero for a representative, and then all the behavior shows on boundary. And that's the strategy of the proof. Okay. And with this, we have this. But on the other hand, uh, because of the correction term, we have here that makes uh, 
the sign of the integration of this thing are difficult to compute because the reason we can compute B4 is it's the symmetric function of a tensor. So we can use a technique in folding the linear PDE, conformal change of the metric, and treating it uh, under conformal change as a uh, uh, fold in the linear PDE and put it into positive cone and to estimate it and to solve the equation. And here, because we have the correct turn, turn so uh, at this moment, one need to push more the technique of fold in the, PD, the linear PDE to this type of PDE, which we do not know how to do yet. Okay. So but, but we are interested to study this uh, uh, sign and size of this renormalized volume integration of this. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so, any questions? Uh, so, uh, for, this, uh, for, for this expansion, do you assume the uh, isometric? Uh, I mean, do you assume this C to be isometric or only as important half volume? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a, a, this expression is with respect to a competitive metric. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so you do not assume C class to be asymptotic half volume isometric? Or, or C class? Uh, in the early work, in that PDE uh, is respect to the Einstein metric. Oh, okay. Yes, the plus means the plus with respect to G plus. Sorry. Yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker. Yeah, thank you. And